Good morning, everyone. ACS Infrastructure and Dragados Canada are pleased to introduce the Honorable Francois-Philippe Champagne, Canada's Minister of Infrastructure and Communities as the opening keynote speaker at P3 2018. Uh, ACS Dragados has been involved in P3 projects across Canada for over a decade, and right now we're partnering with many of you in the room in the development of critical infrastructure initiatives, most of which are being developed under P3 schemes, such as the Eglinton Crosstown, which was mentioned, uh, the Finch Light Rail Project, and the 427 here in Ontario, as well as the REM and the New Champlain Bridge in Montreal, just to name a few. A month ago, we were very pleased to get to host Minister Champagne and the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, at the official start of construction for the Gordie Howe International Bridge Project in Windsor. That was a truly exciting day, and I think one that will only be topped when the bridge officially opens. So, the, the closely watched project, which is years in the making, will have a huge impact on improving trade and the connection between Canada and the United States. This is of huge interest to the minister and to all of us in the room who understand that investing in infrastructure is an investment in the communities and in jobs, which help drive economic growth uh, for all Canadians. In his keynote, Minister Champagne will discuss the role public-private partnerships can play in the government's $180 billion Investing in Canada plan. Uh, appointed on July 18th of 2018 by Prime Minister Trudeau, Minister Champagne has spent the past few months visiting major infrastructure construction projects from coast to coast and meeting with many of Canada's infrastructure leaders. Previously, he served as Canada's International Trade Minister and as Parliamentary Secretary to Finance Minister Bill Marneau, where he played an instrumental role in developing the Canada Infrastructure Bank. Prior to entering politics, Minister Champagne spent more than 20 years as a businessman, a lawyer, and international trade specialist in large global companies, particularly in the fields of energy, engineering, and innovation. So he brings a wealth of knowledge, which we'll get to hear about today in his keynote. Um, I'm very excited, and please join me in welcoming Minister Champagne to Good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde, bienvenue à Toronto. Welcome to uh, Toronto. It's a great pleasure to have you all here in, in uh, this beautiful city. We all know that Mark is a great host, so uh, uh, he wanted to offer you champagne for breakfast. Uh, so I hope you didn't get confused. That's the champagne you're getting for breakfast this morning. Uh, but I'm really, really delighted uh, to spend some time with you this morning. Uh, this is a great event, not only for Canadians, but for a number of people in the room. 30 countries, you said, Mark, this is truly astonishing. My friends, the key message I have for you this morning is the future is bright uh, for public-private partnership in Canada. And that is the reason why I'm with you here this morning. We want to expand with you the spectrum of opportunities. We want to attract more investment from within Canada and abroad because we know and you know that first-class infrastructure is the best way to attract talent and investments. So thank you for that very warm introduction. That's the second time in about a month we do that together. We should do more of that. You know, I appreciate that. It's very good. Let me uh, acknowledge just a few people uh, are with, with us today. The first one is Kelly Gellis, my deputy minister. It's probably the person you want to meet in this room. Uh, Kelly is an outstanding public servant in Canada, uh, making sure that our 4,200 projects are on the way. And uh, we form a great team, and I'm very pleased, Kelly, that you could be with us today. I understand that Janice uh, Fukushima is with us also this morning. Janice is the chairwoman of uh, the Infrastructure Bank of Canada. She used to be the CFO. Janice is just in the back there. She used to be the CFO of Royal Bank of Canada, and she was employee number one. So uh, Janice, thank you for everything you did for Canada and, and certainly putting the bank in the right track. I also want to acknowledge John Manley. You heard from him, former cabinet minister, an outstanding Canadian whom I have to see your portrait every morning as I walk in my office. So I do know you were an infrastructure minister because I see your picture as I walk in and I always bow to you, John, for the great work you did uh, providing infrastructure to, to Canada. And let me 
I have a special welcome. I would say to my new friend and his beautiful wife, uh, the governor of Puerto Rico, uh, which is with us this morning. Sir, why don't you stand up so that everyone can recognize um, that you've been uh, coming with us. It's, it's a great honor, uh, Governor, that I had the chance to uh, exchange with you about infrastructure needs. Uh, obviously, we have followed as Canadians with much interest, and I would say as the international community, uh, what has gone in Puerto Rico. And I can, you probably feel that you've got a lot of friends here in this room, and uh, certainly we want to play a role. I think the audience want to play a role in ensuring a uh, great future for the good people of Puerto Rico. So welcome to Canada, sir. It's a real honor to have you. I also want to express my sincere thanks to Mark Romoff. Mark has been an outstanding supporter uh, of this organization. He has shown extraordinary leadership as the head of the Canadian Council of Public-Private Partnerships for many, many years. And as the chair of the jury of our government Smart Cities Challenge, and I'll tell you a bit more about that, and it's very timely, Madame Sorel, when you presented the role of technology in improving the lives of people. We'll come to that because the Smart City Challenge and Mark is a tireless champion of using better technology, more technology to drive better outcomes as a tool to develop stronger, healthier, and more livable cities and communities across our great country. So thank you, Mark, for being such a passionate advocate. But above all, on behalf of all Canadians, always being there when we ask you to take up on a new role. We know that your plate is pretty full, but every time we have asked you, you stand up and you've decided to help us again. So on behalf of all Canadians, I just want to give you a big round of applause and to thank you. I would say, ladies and gentlemen, what an honor to be among such an outstanding group of professionals. I had the chance over the weekend to look at the number of your bios and realizing how important and, and the key people we have in this room to shape together a better future. Many of you represent internationally recognized company that support the important services governments delivers to Canadians. Because you will find in this room different order of governments. I represent the federal government, but we have colleagues from the provincial and territorial governments as well as municipal governments here in this room. Without you, Canada cannot possibly meet the sizable infrastructure need that exists in our country. You would certainly appreciate for our foreign guests being the uh, second largest country in the world in terms of land mass, that our infrastructure needs are tremendous. Our government values the participation of the private sector to drive better results in our nation's infrastructure. You are, after all, ladies and gentlemen, our strategic partners to deliver 21st century infrastructure I would add on time and on budget. Although I'm meeting many of you for the first time, I already feel like I'm among colleagues. As you have heard before entering public life, I worked in the infrastructure sector just like you. I started as a lawyer, then switched to business, and then turned politician. So I will let you judge whether I choose the right career path after all. My time at global engineering firms such as ABB in Zurich for more than a decade, or with Amec Foster Wheeler in London for uh, the last five years before I entered politics, taught me one thing which I know you share, is to think big. That is especially important when companies like you identify opportunities and partnership which are behind, as you know better, every success story. I'm also the man of a an entrepreneur from Shawinigan in Quebec. And for those who are Canadian in the room, you know what Shawinigan mean in our country. We turn a small wastewater treatment business into an international success story. For my father, I learned the value of entrepreneurship, which is at the art of taking risks, smart risks, working hard to achieve a vision. In fact, I remember he kept reminding us that the only place where success comes before work is in the dictionary. Let me say a few words about Canada's leadership in petri infrastructure globally. After all, if you've decided to travel to Canada because you recognize that together we can shape the petri model, not only in Canada, not only in North America, but obviously around the world. We all know how much business values stability, predictability, and the rule of law. 
They are what I call oftentimes the key pillars of the investment climate. And I challenge any one of you to find me a place in the world where you have significant investment without these key pillars, which are essential to strive. In Canada, we have a well-established petri industry that has raised the bar for infrastructure procurement at home and abroad. Canada's petries are based on a collaboration between public sponsors and just like you, private sector players. Most of these players are here today representing all areas of infrastructure delivery. Without this group of experienced and recognized players that you are, the Canadian petri market could not have come this far. Our success requires innovation and partnership with the private sector. That's why I encourage you not only to think big, but to think smart and to help us build the infrastructure of the 21st century, infrastructure that is modern, resilient, and green. My friend, my message to you today is simple. The future is bright for public-private partnership in Canada. Our government values the benefits of applying private sector discipline and innovation, and I think we saw a good example of that in your video, to the procurement of a broad range of publicly owned and controlled infrastructure. P3 is contributing in a meaningful way to the government's focus on long-term goals and outcomes for citizens because they focus on the integration of various phases of infrastructure development and implementation. By ensuring the effective transfer to the party's best place to manage them, we are ensuring that not only is our public infrastructure well built and well designed using the latest technology, but also that it is maintained over the full life cycle of the assets with proper care and attention. You won't be surprised that our government's vision is to encourage public and private sector partnership and to push them even further to find innovative solutions to deliver the much needed infrastructure that Canadians rely on every day. And I would think that this is something quite similar, whether we're talking about Puerto Rico, whether we're talking about states in the United States or different countries around the world. Partnering with the private sector is a, an important way to deliver more and faster for Canadians. That's why our government, as was said, is investing a historic sum of about 180 billion over the next 12 years. And if you think this is the federal contribution, we're looking at something closer to probably 300 billion over the next decade or so. And why we established the Canada Infrastructure Bank, which I'll tell you a bit more about in a minute, to invest in infrastructure to serve, obviously, the public interest. Many of you in this room represent investors from this country and abroad who are looking for opportunities to invest in long-lived infrastructure projects with appropriate risks-adjusted returns. I am here to tell you that private sector involvement is not only needed, it must be increased in the years to come. And I recall my day as the International Trade Minister of Canada, as the media used to call me jokingly, Canada's Chief Marketing Officer. I remember that particular meeting where I was in the Middle East, promoting Canada to investors talking about investing in our country. And I remember the chairman of that group looking at me and said, Minister, where would you put your money today if not in Canada? if you want to have a secured return and want to make sure that you can contribute meaningfully to projects. So that's why I'm calling upon you, the investors in the room. Clearly, Canada is probably your best bet for the decades to come when it comes to investments. And that's why with the Infrastructure Bank, we'll make sure that it's easier for you to identify bankable projects and that we will be working with you. Our Infrastructure Plan is designed to expand the opportunities for the public sector to attract private sector investment, as I said, both from within Canada and globally. Over the next decade, there'll be a tremendous opportunities for the private sector to participate in projects. And I know you'll hear from Pierre Lavallee, our CEO, uh, I think tomorrow, uh, talking to you about more 
what's the bank role, how we intend to invest, and what's the pipeline of project. We've seen the refinement of the Petri model in Canada over time, and I've seen governments at all levels adopt the procurement model where it makes sense. And a number of projects have already been mentioned, but allow me to mention the, the Valley Line light rail transit in Edmonton and Alberta, the expansion of the Grow Rail network here in Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. We also talk about building hospitals for the first time in Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and Labrador on the eastern coast of our country. And if you look north, a place where there's tremendous, and Mark and, and uh, the council have made us aware about thinking how we're going to build infrastructure in the north. If you look in the Northwest Territories, is also using a Petri approach to build the Chilco all-season road. And I can assure you that's quite of a sight, and I'm supposed uh, to visit that in the not-too-distant future. This project, to give you a sense how we are building the nation with these projects, is going to create an all-weather access to the region which will support lower cost of living for population in the area, improve obviously the quality of life of people, and allow for sustainable resource development, tourism, and other economic benefits for the community up there. As you well know, there are many opportunities to use Petri to improve the lives of Canadians in many ways, and obviously in many regions. My own department is ever seeing two major P3 projects which were mentioned, and most of our partners are in the room. There are the Montreal's new Champlain Bridge, which is nearly complete, and the Gordiau International Bridge, which is being built at the busy border crossing between Windsor and Detroit. And to give you a sense of magnitude for those who are not familiar with how strategic these crossings are, if you take the Champlain Bridge, 60 million users a year, 20 billion of trade is going to that crossing, the actual crossing, so you can imagine how significant what we're achieving together. If you look at the Gordia Bridge, that's 30% of all merchandise trade going through that corridor in North America, to give you a sense of perspective. That corridor only represents 30% of merchandise trade between Canada and the United States. So you are part of the most strategic assets that this country is building. These partnerships show that Canada already has a successful track of partnering with you to deliver best-in-class infrastructure for Canadians and also infrastructure that are strategic for our current and future prosperity. But part of my mission as Minister of Infrastructure and Communities is also to attract global investment to Canada while creating opportunity for infrastructure firms in this country to become global players. And let me give you a sense of perspective. You may have heard our Prime Minister say Canada is today the only G7 country in the world with a free trade agreement with all other G7 countries. Today, Canada is not a country of 36 million inhabitants, but you shouldn't think of Canada as a country which has preferential market access to 1.5 billion consumers in the world, to the trade agreement we have done with Europe called CETA, to the one we're going to ratify, the CPTPP, and yeah, you can blame me for the name, because it started TPP, and then with 10 other, 11 other nations, we start fiddling with the name, so it ended up CPTPP, but that's going to be our free trade with Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Malaysia, to name a few, and obviously with the US MCA, getting access to the US and Mexico. So my message to you is that Canada is an ideal location obviously for global firms like you to operate because it's not, it's not just about stability, predictability, and rule of law, but I think you would agree with me in this world today, market access is key, and labor mobility, which is allowing you labor mobility through these agreements, is making Canada the obvious place to be based. It is obvious in a country as vast as Canada that public investment alone cannot fulfill the demand for new infrastructure. So let me say a few words about the Infrastructure Bank of Canada. You will hear more about the bank in details, but let me say that with the bank, our government has created a new tool. I call that a new tool in our toolbox to finance infrastructure in this country. The Petri model that we're talking about here was an important building block in the formation of the Canada Infrastructure Bank. 
It allows, for example, private sector partners to be brought in earlier for the planning and development stage. And that's something we have heard from you, saying bring us on board earlier so we can better design projects, can better execute, and hopefully use technology to provide better assets for the people. And that's why when we've looked at that, our role with the Infrastructure Bank is to develop the pipeline of projects and bring investor and the public sector together to have, obviously, appropriate risk sharing in building these projects. In the process of doing that, the banks is advancing new models of partnerships that will allow to get more projects built in countries like Canada. It also stretches further public dollars by attracting private investment to free up government resources for other infrastructure priorities. And Mark said it at the beginning, we have a role to explain to citizens why are these institutions are key in building a better future. I usually summarize it to Canadians that this is about building more, better, and faster for them. So our goal is to contribute to steady long-term economic growth while improving the quality of life of Canadians. That's our mission. And the Infrastructure Bank demonstrate our government's strategic and long-term approach to infrastructure investment. Similar to project sponsors and proponents that are here in the room today. My key message to you is that I think our strategic visions are aligned in many, many ways, and that's why I think you are the key partners in delivering for the people. My friends, I want to emphasize the magnitude of the opportunity before you. I don't think there's been a better time for you to take a moment to look at what we're doing in Canada and see what role are you going to play in making a difference. This is a chance for the public sector and the Canadian infrastructure industry that you represent to continue to forge game-changing partnership, invest together in projects, and demonstrate leadership in the global infrastructure landscape. So in conclusion, I would say seize the moment. There's never been a better time to invest in Canada. I would say be ambitious. Think big and smart with our partners to see how can technology bring us further together in delivering for the people. And finally, let's build together in the infrastructure of the 21st century, which is modern, resilient, and green. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us this morning. Thank you. Yeah, I think so. How are you going to answer questions if you're not on stage? You know, our question period is at 2.15 in the House of Commons, so it's going to be my warm-up session. So anything that you want, uh, you know, about the government, about our policy, about Petri is, is obviously fine. Mark, it's all yours. That's great. Well, thank you very much. And I would say you are clearly still salesman-in-chief. You needn't worry <laughs> about that. So here are some of the questions that have come up sure. from the audience. They're a little bit challenging, so if you, if you know... What the heck, let's go Listen, for it, right? This is the purpose of democracy, is to challenge elected leaders, right? There you go. So, the first question is, what can Canada learn from the political backlash to the P3 model in the United Kingdom? Uh, I would say, and, and obviously, as you appreciate, those are, are my own personal reflection, at getting a question like that. And having lived in England for the last five years before I moved to Canada, um, I think one of the things we have not done so well and I obviously look at the guy in the mirror when I say that. Uh, but obviously, being with all of you, I think we need to reflect how we explain to people what we're trying to achieve. Um, I was in the House of Commons, in our own House of Commons, when we created the Infrastructure Bank, and it was mentioned when I was at Finance, when we put that in the budget. And the fear factor around that, people trying to wonder, what is the government trying to do now for which I'm already paying taxes and will there be fees and whether the government will be privatizing other type of assets that are usually uh, delivered by government uh, to citizens. And I think part of our job was to reassure people, like I was saying, this is about delivering better and faster to the people and making sure that our investment would be to crowd in not to cry out other players in the industry, which would free up capital, which is scarce in any democracies these days, to invest in things where the private sector would not be investing. And I think the fear that is coming from that is us not spending enough time explaining why we're doing what we're doing. 
and why it makes sense and why people will see a better outcome. I'll give you an example. I don't know how much time you want me to take, but I'll give you that. Uh, I was with a governor of a U.S. state recently, and he was explaining to me, he said, Minister, you know, and, and some of you maybe Americans in the room would know that better than me, that when they create a particular uh, interchange on a highway or an exit that would favor a community, a particular community, uh, they usually would have a fee for that community which is going to benefit from, from the mm -hmm. asset. And he was telling me, Minister, it's amazing to think that when they do plebiscite or referendum, they usually get more than 95% approval to increase taxes, to provide benefits to people in that particular area to infrastructure. Because people see a direct link, not to play with words like a bridge between their taxes and the benefit, spending probably 20 minutes less in their car or other things. So I think it's that we need to provide the benefits, provide, show to people the benefits. And I think we're all in this together. Uh, and certainly we're trying to do a better job with the bank, with the department, to explain to Canadians, this is not about privatizing things that the government should otherwise do. This is about making sure that we crowd in people. We can also build more in assets that would generate revenue that we can attract, um, obviously, investments. Thank you. I know that's a, minister, that's a message, Minister, that will resonate very well with this audience. I think we have time for one more question. So um, how does the federal government uh, envisage P3 can be used to drive innovation in both technology and delivery for infrastructure projects? Well, our role is obviously we can do that different ways. Obviously, we, we, we put these programs out. As you know, in the 180 billion, we said we want particular outcome. So the government of Canada said we won't tell communities across the nation what to do, but we'll tell the communities what kind of outcome we would want, one of which was to reduce greenhouse gas emission. And one of the bucket where we invested was about public transit, understanding that the more we invest in public transit, the better impact we'll have on greenhouse gas emission. We did the same thing about green infrastructure. We did the same thing about communities. We did the same about northern and rural communities. I'll give you an example of two things that come to mind. Um, I was in northern Saskatchewan, some of you may know, in western part of our country. And why we cannot, dic we, we cannot dictate centrally what should be the outcome, they were saying, ministers, if you were just to increase our runways by 300 meters, that would allow us to, to land bigger planes, reduce carbon footprint because there would be less traffic, allow us to bring more cargo and reduce the price of food by about 50% in northern communities. That's just a smart thing to do. So that's why in a country as vast and diverse as Canada, we need to focus on outcome. Uh, the second thing I would say is think big. I'll give you the example. I was at Novabus uh, recently, which is a partnership with Volvo doing hybrid and electric buses. And they showed me this video about Gothenburg, south of Sweden, close to Malmö. And in Gothenburg, uh, obviously transit has been reinvented, so the bus is electric, and it gets into the university, into the library, and into the cafeteria. Because Sweden has a similar climate than us, so the concept that you should be waiting outside for public transit is over now. So the bus is electric, so it comes within the building. So I think people like you, the future of mobility is probably to have these type of assets coming in the library or let's say in the hospital or in the shopping center. So it's about thinking big. And it's not about decades to come. I can tell you that um, one city in Canada, Quebec City, has already adopted a similar model based on GPS, where they don't have full electric buses, but they have GPS to tell the bus to go electric between that road and that road, gets into an interchange, get people to get in the bus from inside, for those of you who are not familiar, the winter I'm used to, now it's getting a bit warmer, but uh, when I was young, you, you could be at minus 30. So obviously, rethinking mobility in our community is essential. And Mark, you've been doing a great job with the Smart City Challenge to provide better outcome for Canadians uh, through technology and involving people in the room with the smartest idea. And you showed us uh, what the future of technology can bring to the infrastructure community. It's an exciting future ahead for sure. Minister, thank you so very much for thank being here. Thank you very much, everyone. Merci tout le monde. Bonne fin de journée. Thanks for being here. Thank you so very much. You were really always fabulous, right?